Let's come on to this issue of face masks then. What happened in the last 24 hours that seemed to kill government faith in British common sense? I don't really think that's the right way to caricature it. The no, I truth think it about was. this. Uh, well, the, the truth is that um, the evidence and the advice has been evolving in this space for some time. The World Health Organization changed their advice in June. Following that, we gave a very uh, clear steer to people, an advisory steer, that they mm. should uh, wear face coverings when out and about. We then made it mandatory uh, on public transport in mm -hmm. June. And now, as we start to loosen uh, other restrictions, uh, opening pubs, opening yeah. restaurants. Uh, we think we need to consider other mitigating measures to control the virus. Secretary of State, one of your colleagues yesterday came onto this programme and said he didn't feel that it did need to be made mandatory because that he had faith in, in British people's common sense to do the right thing. What changed? Well, I think nothing's changed in that sense. We do have uh, uh, faith in people's We do have faith, but you're telling them to do it. We have uh, faith in them to, uh, you know, abide by this uh, this rule. But the truth is, once you make something mandatory, uh, people do take it more seriously and they're more likely to follow it. Prior to that, it was advisory, so not everybody did. It was a mistake, and wasn't it? It should have been made compulsory. You could have said on Sunday, right, this is coming in on the on the twenty fourth. Uh, we're making it compulsory. That would have been very clear. It would have got rid of the confusion that's existed. Well, I think um, it's unhelpful to get too obsessed by uh, the announcements of these things, Tom. You, you know, you've. But this uh, is important. This is, this, in... is, this is trust for, uh, of uh, members of the public in what they're hearing in order to be able to follow resolutely, in a common sense way, those instructions that the government is giving. It's been a, a, a mess. Well, I don't think it has because you understand how these things work. The truth about this is that the government had been considering a change in this area over the last few days, but hadn't made that decision and therefore wasn't ready to announce it. And, uh, you know, you'll understand because you've uh, you've worked mm -hmm. in uh, press offices um, until a decision's made and agreed, uh, you can't announce it. And so uh, when people like Michael Gove were um, uh, on the airwaves on Sunday, they were obviously explaining the position as it was then. Uh, once a decision was taken and communicated and announced, uh, we're able to so this was the plan. This was the plan. The confusion was part of the plan. Um, I don't think it was, it's right to say the confusion was part of the plan. It's just that a um, an issue was under consideration, but a decision had not been made, and therefore a decision could not be announced until it was made. Uh, yeah. And I, I think you just need to look at this in the wider context, that the, the advice to wear face coverings has been there since May. We've made it mandatory on public transport since June. This is the next you know, incremental step, which reflects changing evidence, changing advice from the World Health Organization, but also the fact that we are trying to chart a course out of the lockdown in some other sectors. And the logic is, tell me if I'm wrong, but if you come into contact with people you don't spend a lot of time with in an, an enclosed area, you should wear a mask now. That's, that's part of the logic of this, right? <laughs> The logic has always been that if you are uh, having um, symptoms, if you're carrying um, uh, the virus, wearing a face covering makes it less likely that you will pass it on. Mm -hmm. So it's always been the case that it probably provides um, more protection um, for, for people, uh, you know, to stop people catching it rather than preventing the wearer of the mask mm -hmm. uh, from catching it per se. That's been the advice all along, but also, you know, in enclosed environments, in retail environments where lots of people are, are mingling, um, then obviously you're coming into contact with more people. The risk is higher uh, than if, for instance, you're in a working environment sure. with the same so cohort of people. Why not then extend what's happening now com made compulsory in shops to, say, restaurants or pubs? Well, we've had to take a sort of a pragmatic approach throughout this. And the truth is that if people are going into a uh, pub either to drink uh, or indeed to eat and eat in a restaurant, it's obviously just not practical to require them to wear a face mask when they're trying to eat. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it's not But to there's say still the same the... risk, though, isn't there? There would still be the risk of if you're not wearing a face mask, if you've, uh, whether you have um, the, the symptoms or not, if you're in an enclosed environment with people you don't know for a long period of time, you could be spreading it. Well, it is the case, yes, that there is, there are obviously risks, and that's why with restaurants and with pubs, other measures have been put in place, social distancing measures, extra emphasis on, uh, you know, sanitising tables after people move and so on. But, you know, with, with all of the approaches we've taken, it's about managing the collective risk to keep the mm -hmm. overall infection rate over contr under control. It's not about necessarily looking at individual risks on individual uh, premises. We're having to do some pretty extraordinary things 
things to try mm-hmm. to manage uh, this virus. Um, nothing we've done uh, is ever going to be perfect, but we have to just try and uh, keep things in perspective and take pragmatic steps where we're able to, to help control the virus. Why July 24th? I think it just gives people uh, time to prepare to make sure they can get a mask. It gives retailers time to prepare their and approach. And it's definitely a mask, right? We're talking about people getting masks rather than coverings Well, a face now? covering. No, right. it's, a, it's a face covering. So, so be, not a it mask. Could be a, not a, not a medical grade mask, right. but it could be a, um, a face covering, uh, a cloth face and covering who's exempted? would be sufficient. Well, there are exemptions, uh, I think, for people with, um, so, I mean, Matt, Matt Hancock, health secretary will be saying more on this later. I think there are exemptions for uh, young children and uh, certain people with certain medical conditions mm-hmm. where uh, wearing a face mask isn't uh, right for them. And you're absolutely certain that the police are going to be able to issue these £100 fines for people who don't wear them in shops? <sighs> Well, the challenge in this area is not really new in that um, from the beginning of lockdown, the police have had to enforce measures that we've introduced under the 1984 Public Health Act. And so um, they've had to move people on who were sunbathing, break up groups of people in the parks, uh, question people when they were out and about. None of that was easy. And the fines Um, for people on public transport as well. Do we know how many people have been fined for not wearing masks on public transport? I don't know how many have been fined, but the point I'd make is on all of these things, once you make it mandatory, I think it sends a very clear signal that people must do this. now. It does. You have the ultimate uh, sanction of financial penalties um, uh, where you need to use those. But the police use them um, lightly and in a pragmatic way only when there's a sort of willful um, refusal to follow the rules. Generally, what we'll see here, I think, is retailers uh, helping to ensure compliance by giving advice to people when they come in. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't work, then the police have that enforcement function. Uh, 